in um, today's lesson. Okay, so um, today we're going to be concentrating on light and shadow. So how do we understand light and shadow as painters and how do we put it to use? So um, I apologize to any of my students who have been in my drawing classes. So you've seen this slide before, but it's, it's obviously pertinent for our class again today. So why am I showing this image? So this is an, a random image that I found online of, you know, as people can tell, it's an office space. I'm showing this image because this is usually the way we all experience light. You know, we all take light for granted. We never really think about light because light is always and everywhere available to us, except maybe in very specific situations. So for example, a couple of years ago, I spent a week in Maine one summer. And um, I distinctly remember turning off the lights to go to bed and being met with this inky blackness. So it, it, in a cabin in the middle of the woods in Maine, when I turned out the lights, there was absolutely no ambient light anywhere. And, and that blackness was as heavy as an object on top of me. And I had that experience because we, and I, and I am sure that this is true of everybody here today, because we are actually constantly surrounded by light, even in the middle of the night. So if I get up in the middle of the night to do something, there's a light on somewhere. You know, there's light coming from, um, the wiring and the modems of my technology. Um, you know, usually there's some form of a night light. There's light filtering in through the windows that comes from the street lights. Right? So we never, we never really experience um, light and shadow in a way that we really take note of, except in very specific situations. Again, because light is everywhere available to us. So we never think about it anymore. So we're usually in situations like this. You know, we walk into a room and there's probably a window somewhere, lights coming in. There's probably lights on the ceiling, you know, that's standard in um, architectural spaces nowadays. So lights coming from above. There are probably third sources of light somewhere, something like this, right? There's light emanating from screens. We're surrounded by light, so we don't even notice what it's doing. Um, in this class, we're going to very carefully notice and think about how light works. So the consciousness I'm talking about, the fact that we absolutely take light for granted and don't even notice it, um, is a, a, a relatively recent consciousness. Um, and, and I just want to say one other thing. This is often the kind of lighting situation that you will encounter when you take a painting class, most painting classes. Um, you'll probably walk into a room that has some windows. Um, so there's going to be the light from the windows. And then someone's going to flick on the fluorescent lights, the horror of contemporary flu fluorescent lights. Right, that weird um, corpse creating gray blue light that assaults us from above. Um, I hate that lighting at Clapper Hall. Right? I never turn on those lights. Um, but usually in a painting class, someone flicks on those lights. So there's suddenly light coming from everywhere. So we, we have no conscious of light. Um, Again, that's a relatively recent consciousness, or maybe I should say lack of consciousness. So if we think about light before the advent of um, widespread availability of artificial light, people were probably, almost certainly, aware of light coming from a single source. 
right? So either light was being encountered out in the world during the day. And it used to be that all, virtually all human activity was arranged so that it happened during daylight hours. Otherwise you simply couldn't see, right? Um, so when people were inside, they were again, usually dealing with light from a single source um, because mo for the most part, interiors um, before the advent of the mass production of, it, of construction materials, interiors would have a single light source because windows were very expensive. In order to put a window into a building um, and to be able to have a building that was still weatherproof would have been very expensive. And um, so there was usually a single light source, even in relatively wealthy homes. So we see a situation like this where a, a, a individual is going about their daily activities and they're being illuminated by a single light source. So we touched on this yesterday a bit in relationship to this image. Um, this image, this student painting by um, the French painter Ang, um, where as part of his studies, he was tasked to complete this half length human figure. And the figure has been very deliberately illuminated so that light is coming from a single direction. Um, and then the artist is able to deal with the complexity of volume, right? The sense of the roundness of the figure and space, the sense that that figure, that that volumetric three-dimensional figure is sitting in a three-dimensional location uh, or, or a, a three-dimensional space. Um, the light that the artist is using is helping that artist achieve that illusion of the three-dimensional volume existing in a three-dimensional space. Okay, so we're gonna break down what exactly is happening as light falls on the form that we're looking at here. In this case, the form of the human figure. So again, we looked at um, this image yesterday. This is a painting by Claude Monet. Again, an artist dealing very carefully with light and shadow um, and um, using light and shadow in exactly the same way. I shouldn't say exactly the same way, but the, using the fundamentals of light and shadow, understanding how, what happens to a form as we perceive it when it's illuminated by a single light source. And there's actually a complexity of things happening here that are not happening in the previous image. Um, let's see, what do I wanna say about that? So let's go back to the pre, well, I, I'm gonna hold off on what I was about to say. I'm gonna hold off on that for a later lecture. Let's just be a little bit more simple um, today. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. Um, slide. Well, actually, maybe this will be instructive to talk about. So this is a Monet painting uh, as well, a Monet painting. And let's go back to our Ang painting. And we talked about um, the fact that if all of these paintings or, or several of the paintings we've looked at, the artist is very deliberately using light as coming from one direction. And they've set up the object so that um, the light and shadow, that, that the object is illuminated by a light source, a single light source coming from one direction. So um, maybe this is very obvious at this point, but anyone want to say, wh where's the light coming from in this painting? Upper left. Upper left, right. Upper left is a very common direction of light. I suppose upper right too. Yeah, I suppose so. Um, and then this painting? Same, upper left. Upper left and slightly behind the objects, right? So the cast shadow is, is slightly moving towards us. So it's coming from the, 
coming from behind. Um, so what about this painting? Where's the light coming from? It feels like it's coming from directly above. It's probably coming from directly above. And what's happening in this? Why, why is the light a little bit, the light's a little bit more ambiguous. The, the light's more clear in this Monet painting, right? The light's more ambiguous here. Why is that? Anyone want to take it's a guess? Overcast. It's, it's overcast. It's not a direct source. Right. It's an overcast day. So, um, so we're not getting direct sun, right? So the sun is being diffused by the clouds. So we're getting a kind of soft, um, a, a soft light where it's a little bit more difficult to clearly um, identify where the light's coming from and what the, the relationship is between lights and shadows. Although if you, it, bearing in mind what we know about light and shadow, you can start seeing here, even though it's not quite as graphically clear as in the previous images, you'll notice that the, the, the planes on the forms that are facing the sky are illuminated and the planes underneath the volumes are in shadow, right? So the shadows, pretty much happen on the underside of the forms. As the forms turn underneath and away from the light source, they go into shadow, although it's not quite as clear here. What's another, this is getting a little bit off topic for today, but what, what's another thing we can see in the difference between the light in this painting and this painting? So there's, a, there's another prominent difference, which I think will be useful to talk about because it's something we're going to be thinking about. What's the difference? We have direct sunlight here. We have indirect sunlight filtered through the clouds here. It looks whiter. It, it looks whiter, did it you? Look, yeah, whiter. it looks like there's more white in the light. Yeah, we, you could say that. Um, there's a, I would put it a slightly different way, but that's, you could say that. So here, like if we look at the color of the grass here, um, it, it does look, it, there's certainly more white in it here. So it's, this is a kind of bluish white color um, where the white is probably less and there's much more presence of the intense pure color. What's it about to do with like the time of day and the placement of the sun in the sky? Yeah, so um, probably the time of day is different. Um, but there's also, what's another very different, very prominent difference? So, and I, uh, I know this is a ra rather open question, but I, I want people to really start getting into the habit of looking very carefully at how our perception of obje objects changes depending on differences in light or differences in light source. So the first image, this image, the haystacks feels more intense. It's more intense, that's true. Brighter. It's brighter for sure. So uh, when, we're, when we're experiencing objects under sunlight, we have that sense that there's a greater brightness, there's a more intensity of light, there's more there's more extremes of light to shadow. So that, that kind of experience of extremes creates a feeling of intensity where this is more mellow. What's an overall color difference from here? Um, to for me, I'm seeing um, the warmness in the other um, painting and the coolness um, in this one here, the choice of colors, even though it's all outside. And in the warmer painting, it's probably green, but because of the intensity of the sun, it appears more yellow. Um, but yes, the, the choice of color that the artist used to um, depict the moment and how the sun is reflecting on the objects, on the, on the plants and the grass. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly what I was looking for, good. Um, so what we can clearly see here is a difference in the, the intensity of the light, as, as people have pointed out, but also the color of the light. 
light always has a specific color. So the color of sunlight is a warm yellowish light. And we see th that warm yellow temperature of the light influencing the way we perceive the objects in this painting. So we're, because that light is warm, we're seeing all of these objects as relatively warm. When light, when sunlight filters through clouds, the light refracts off of all those particles. It bounces all over the place. So it picks up other colors and, the, and that, yellow, uh, uh, that yellow color of direct sunlight is altered in that process of being filtered through the clouds and it turns a kind of bluish gray. So the grasses, the bushes in this landscape are being illuminated by a bluish gray light source. So these, so the, the way we perceive the greens of the bushes here is a kind of bluish gray green. The way we perceive the greens here is a, a much more intense yellowish green. So part of thinking about and looking at light is starting to ask yourself, what's the color of this light? Um, that's an, gonna be an, an important part of understanding light. Um, a cool light, right? So light, direct sunlight is warm, but when we get indirect sunlight, so this is indirect sunlight, that color is cool. Um, because the light, when, when we have indirect sunlight, the light is bouncing off of the particles of the blue sky and it's picking up that blue. And so the light becomes a kind of bluish or a relatively bluish gray color. So that's why we're seeing these kind of cool, a cool white, a cool yellowish color here, cool yellow on the map, a kind of cool white, again, as opposed to that yellow intensity of direct sunlight. So we're going to be painting, um, most paintings in this class will be still lives. Um, so here's a, a classic still life um, by a painter named Oscar Melendez, M-E-L-E-N-D-E-Z. He was a Spanish painter, 17th century Spanish painter. He set up this elaborate painting of various foodstuffs and kitchen implements. Um, and as in all the paintings we've looked at, the artist has very carefully illuminated the objects with a light again coming from the upper left. So what happens to an object when it's illuminated by a light source and particularly a light source that an artist has very carefully created or very carefully controlled so that it's coming from a single direction. So artists at this time, they almost had no choice but to use light coming from a single direction. So an artist studio would have had one wall of windows. And by the way, um, artist studios at the time that this artist was working always had north facing windows. So the windows they were using always faced north because if you have windows that face north, you never get direct sunlight. Right, because the, the, sun, the sun is located at the equator of the earth, right? So think about that. So if you have windows facing north, they are always going to be facing away from the light, uh, away from the direction of direct sunlight. So artists deliberately made studios with north facing windows so that the light they, they worked with all day long would be the same. Uh, my studio is north facing windows and I deliberately chose it for that reason. Um, okay, so what's happening here? We have, we have the light coming from the left. We have a, a, a kind of complicated light shape on the object. And then that object turns away from the light source and it goes into shadow, right? Here's all shadow. So let's, um, let's break that down. Here's light and shadow on a relatively simple form, a simple form painted by a student who took this class at one time. 
Um, this is light and shadow on a simple sphere. This is what our, when I give the first assignment, when we're in the Clapper Hall studios, I have students draw spheres. But since a sphere is not easy to come by, I just, I'm asking you to draw eggs or paint eggs. So we have the light mass and the shadow mass, right? Or let's start talking about that. Or let's start thinking about how light operates when it falls on a form. What, what we get is we get a situation where we can identify a light shape, which we see here, and then a shadow shape on the form. Or we could call it a light side and a dark side. And then when we have an object sitting in a space illuminated by a single light source, we not only have the shadows on the form of the object, and these shadows here, the shadows on the object itself, on the form of the object are called the form shadows. We not only get form shadows, but we also get what's called a cast shadow. A cast shadow is a shadow on surfaces around the object that are created because the object itself is blocking light from hitting those surfaces. So let's look at a sphere um, in a little bit more of where, where, where the elements of light and shadow are a little bit more clear. So this is a, a drawing of a sphere. And how are we, what are we seeing here? As the light comes from the upper left, hits the sphere, and then we lose the light as that object turns away from the light source, right? So as the object turns away from the light source, it's no longer facing the light. So it goes into shadow. That's all that shadows are. They are places on the form or places on an object that are not facing a light source. Now in our, to go back to our first slide, we, we often don't notice shadows because usually we're in a situation where there are multiple light sources. So if there's a place on an object where it would be, be falling into shadow, usually there's another light somewhere close by that's filling in that shadow. So we don't, we don't usually see this situation. So what do we have here? Again, we have our object illuminated by a single light source and we can identify a light mass sometimes also called the light shape. And then we can identify the shadow mass or the dark mass. And in this case, on this sphere, the dark mass is this kind of crescent, a crescent shape of dark. And then we see happening on this volume, as this volume rolls around in space, turns around in space, we see the light and shadow um, falling on that object in a way that light and shadow always falls on any object. Now, sometimes it's more complex and a little bit more ambiguous than what we're looking at here, but light and shadow or light falling on an object will always create the same sequence of changes in the light as it moves from the lights to the shadows. So what is that sequence? Okay, so I'm gonna be tossing out some terms here. Um, I'm not going to test people on these terms, but I would like, and I'm going to ask you to try to start remembering these terms so that we can start having a common language as we talk about um, what's happening in your paintings, how to improve your paintings and so on. And so you start being able to identify these elements of light and shadow and these elements of the world that you're going to be observing. Okay, so let's break this down. So we, we already mentioned we have the light mass and the dark mass. Um, so what happens in the light mass? The, the, the main light area of a light, of a, an illuminated object, is usually referred to as the center light. That's just the kind of generally illuminated area. It's called the center light. We always have the lightest part of the object, and that's referred to as the highlight or 
a more technical term, which you sometimes hear, so I put it in there, it's specular reflection. So we have a highlight on a form. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to this term here. And then we have in the shadow mass, we, have, we always have either more clearly or less clearly observable. We have what's called the core of the shadow. So you'll notice this relatively darker band of shadow, the core of the shadow, and then a lighter area within the shadow, which is called the reflected light. So we have core of the shadow and we have reflected light. Why, why does this happen? As an object turns away from a light source and goes into shadow, why would we have a situation where we see some reflected light and we see this darker area of shadow that we call the core of the shadow? Why would that happen? Anyone wanna take a guess? Or, you know, I guess it would be an educated guess based on your observation here. Isn't it because the shape is turning away from us? The shape is turning, it's not turning away, it is turning away from us, but this is happening because it's turning away from the light source. Light, yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes into right. shadow. But why do we get, so in other words, the form, this part of the form is illuminated. So we can see it, right? The only reason we see things is because they are illuminated. We don't see things if there's no light. Right? That's just the way vision works. Right? Light reflects off objects, it enters our eye, it's processed by the optic nerve, and then an image is registered in our brain. So in theory, when there's no light hitting an object, we don't see anything. And this, this object is turning away from the light source. So this part of the object here is not facing the light source, so it couldn't be getting any light but we can still see it. So in theory, it, in theory, if there's no light hitting this object or the object here, we wouldn't see anything. It would just turn into in, an imperceptible, absolutely dark um, void in theory, but that's not happening here. So why are we able to see, even though this object has turned away from the light source, why are we still able to, to make out um, certain features of the object, even though it's in shadow? It's the reflection off the surface below it. It's the reflection off the surface below it, right? So that it's not that there's no light hitting this at all. There's just no direct light hitting it. Light's reflecting off the surface around it and really multiple surfaces in the room and reflecting back in. Right, so we get light passing by the object, hitting the table here, and then bouncing back here. So here we get indirect light. So when light has to bounce off a surface, it loses some of its intensity. So what happens in an object illuminated by a single light source is it goes into shadow, but then there's light that reflects back into it. And it creates in the shadow mass of an object what we call the reflected light. Reflected light here. And then what we call here the core of the shadow. So light is bouncing into the object, getting the reflected light. And then this thin band, this thin plane here, the core of the shadow plane, is neither facing the reflecting surfaces nor is it facing the direct light source. So it's, it remains darker, certainly darker than the, the light side and darker than the reflective surfaces. So that accounts for the, the light mass, the shadow mass, reflected light and core of the shadow. So this sphere is blocking the light from illuminating this part of the table, right? So the light is coming down from this direction it's passing by the sphere here, but because the sphere right here is blocking the light, the light can't get to the table down here. So we're, create, we're getting this a creation of a cast shadow. Cast shadow that 
re that um, reflects the shape of the object blocking the light source. Um, the darkest parts of the shadow mass are called the occlusion shadow or the shadow accent. Those are the very darkest parts of the situation you're looking at where no light is reaching. So usually that will be a dark, um, a dark accent underneath objects where no light is able to reach and so on. Okay, so light side, dark side, core of the shadow, reflected light. And we're going to be seeing all those elements in the object we paint today. Um, we see here a half tone. Okay, so let's, let's address that. Um, what is the half tone? So what, something I, I haven't listed here is what's called the terminator. So the terminator is the, is the line on the object dividing the light from the shadow. So we see the terminator wrapping around the object here. That's the point on the object where, there, where the, there's no longer illumination and the object drops into shadow. Um, so terminator, again, is a kind of technical term. It's a term that's come into use in the past 10 or 20 years. I had never heard it as a student. I used to just call this the shadow edge or that's what, that's what this was referred to, which I think is a kind of better term. It seems less jargony, but you'll hear Terminator um, also. So that's where the, the um, where the light stops and the shadow begins is the Terminator. So just to look at another image, that we looked at today, Right here, this line dividing light from shadow is what's referred to as the terminator or the shadow edge. Now that we're looking at this image again, we can see the core of the shadow on this painting, that slightly darker edge of shadow, the reflected light in here, right? The light mass highlights. Okay, so why, so if, the, if this is the terminator dividing light from shadow, why isn't there just a crisp, sharp line where we, we have light and then dark? Why is there a half tone here? What's happening? Or why is there this kind of middle tone that's often referred to as a half tone? Why, because, why, why is that there? Because it's not a sharp edge like a cube. Exactly. It's around it's a wrong edge. Right, it's not, not a, even an edge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes it's referred to as shadow edge, but right, it's not a sharp division like on a cube. It's a division where there's a series of um, planes that are in different um, relationships to a light source. So this plane is directly facing the light source. And then as we roll around the object, we get a series of planes that are progressively turning away from the light source. So this plane on the object is still facing the light, but at more of an oblique angle. So it's getting less light. This plane is getting a little bit less light. So what we get here is what's called the half tone. And that transitions the shadow into the light so that we're not getting a, an absolutely sharp division between light and shadow. Okay, what a cast shadow, core of the shadow, form shadow. So the form shadow, um, okay. So again, these terms, I'd like people to start thinking about them in such a way that you remember them. So we, we wanna think about the light mass, the dark mass, the terminator, core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, shadow accent or occlusion shadow, half tones, um, center light, highlight. So all of these elements of light and shadow are elements that we're going to be using in our paintings. So let's just look um, at, at another drawing um, where again, we can very clearly see the light and shadow situation. So this is a drawing by a, a 18th century French painter named Pierre Paul Proudhon. And um, he did these drawing, these kinds of drawings all throughout his life, these highly worked up um, figure drawings. Um, and so we're looking at a situation like all, all of the images we've looked at so far, where the artist has 
taken his subject matter, in this case, the human figure, and posed the figure in a very specific relationship to a light source. So here, the light is coming from the upper right. And we get a situation where there's this complex shape of light on the object, right? In this case, a human figure. Then we have this complex shadow shape, everything from this terminator or this shadow edge over is in shadow. Then we see with clarity the reflected lights bouncing off these surfaces here, the core of the shadows. We see very clearly the half tones that the artist is using to roll that form around from light into shadow. We can see highlights. We see the cast shadow, occlusion shadows. And so these artists are all using these elements of light and shadow in order to convincingly paint a three-dimensional object. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is they are not simply arbitrarily copying anything that enters into their field of vision. They're looking at an object and then analyzing the light and shadow that they observe on the object and in order to create as convincing a, a, an illusion of a three-dimensional object on a flat surface, they are finding these elements of light and shadow that allow them to most successfully create that illusion. And these elements of light and shadow, light, dark, core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, occlusion shadow, half tones, highlights, those elements of, lights and of light and shadow are on the one hand part of the physical properties of light and shadow, but they are also those elements that are going to allow you to most successfully create a very believable illusion of three-dimensional volumes in a three-dimensional space. And that's what we're going to be trying to do, right? We're going to be taking a flat surface and we are going to be trying to convince the viewer that they are not looking at a flat surface. Instead, we're going to try to convince the viewer that that flat surface is actually a three-dimensional space opening up before them with believable volumetric objects in that space. And one of the fundamental first steps in being able to achieve that is to understand how light works on objects and how to use light in creating these illusions. So here, all those elements of light and shadow are pointed out. I'll post these on Blackboard so you have access to these. Um, this is a, a famous painting by um, a, a 18th century French still life painter. One of the first artists to have in effect made a career by painting nothing but still lives. There were some before, there were some artists who had done them before him, but um, Chardin was the first who really painted primarily, not exclusively, but primarily still lives. So um, I'm showing this for a very simple reason in that he's painting eggs, which is what we're going to paint as our first project. Um, notice again, and I, I would ask people to take note of this as you look at paintings and just at the world around you as part of studying in this class. What is the light situation? Where's the light coming from? How is it falling on objects and so on? So here again, the artist has illuminated the objects from the upper left. And we can look closer at this um, piece of bread with eggs. So we'll notice that the light coming from the upper left is falling on these objects so that we have the light shape, light shape on this more complex form, that complicated light shape. Um, we have the shadow shapes on all these forms. We have the core of the shadow, a, a, a slightly less clear, but nevertheless there core of the shadow. We have the reflected lights. Um, here, there's a very bright reflected light because light's bouncing off this egg, which is placed in close proximity. We have the cast shadows, the occlusion shadows, highlights, and so on. So I know I'm repeating all of these elements over and over again, 
But I'm doing that deliberately so that we start to internalize those terms and we can start looking for, for those elements and talking about them, all of those elements of light and shadow. We mentioned a few minutes ago, the softness of the transition between the dark mass and the light mass on a sphere or on an egg. Notice on this crust of bread where, because of the way the, a wedge has been cut out of the bread, a sharp edge has been created between the light and the shadow. Right, so here we see a sharp edge, a sharp division between the light and the dark. So the terminator in this case is a sharp edge with almost no half tone. Um, here the terminator has that soft gradation of the half tone. So it's an important element to look for. Okay, so um, what I want to do, um, and again, I am deliberately um, going over these elements of light and shadow again in this um, next thing we're going to look at. But I want to show a video um, that's going, again, it's going to go over these terms again. But I think that's one important because of these are, are terms and properties of the visual world and of light and shadow that are very important for us to know. Um, it's important to keep going over them so that we remember them. But also this video is um, useful because um, the person who made this video um, is able to communicate these concepts in a slightly different way with kind of cooler animation. Um, so I think it helps emphasize what we're looking for. So let me pull that up. Um, this is by an artist who has a whole series of instructional art videos online. Um, they're kind of goofy, but they're pretty good. Um, they're, they can be very useful. So it's this person here, Proko, if anyone's interested in um, investigating. So we're gonna look at this video he's done. So. My name is Sora. Enough light to create a visible difference. Okay. Um, so he's going to talk about these elements we've been talking about. So let's watch this. I may stop it a couple times um, just to, to emphasize a few points. And I apologize for its goofiness, but you know, it's a little bit annoying, I find, but uh, some, uh, some useful information. Welcome to Proco. My name is Stan Prokopenko. A lot of you have been asking for a video on shading. The first thing you need to understand when starting to shade is how light affects the appearance of form and how to properly capture the three-dimensional form based on the characteristics of the light in the scene. In some of my previous videos, I talked about things like shapes, values, and edges. But how do we know what shapes, values, and edges to draw? What exactly are we looking for? Well, we're looking at light and how it illuminates the objects in our picture. Light is the reason we see anything and the characteristics of the light can completely change the appearance of the objects it illuminates. So I like to analyze the light in the scene and try to capture it so the viewer can feel the light. Form looking three-dimensional is just a byproduct of correctly capturing the light on the form. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that studying light on form is important. Now let's take a look at all the elements. For this, I'm going to need an egg. For this, I'm going to need an egg. There are two main zones, light and shadow. The edge where the form transitions from light to shadow is the terminator. It's located at the tangent between the light source and the form. In other words, just before the planes start to face away from the light. Let's start by talking about the shadow side. There are two types of shadows. Form shadow is a shadow caused by the planes turning away from the light source. A cast shadow is caused by one form blocking the light from hitting another form. 
This egg is blocking the light from reaching this part of the table. You can find this shape by projecting lines from the light source to the terminator of the first form and continuing those lines to the obstructed form. Shadows will rarely be completely black. Light bounces off objects in the environment and is reflected back into the shadows. This is called reflected light. In this case, the light will bounce off the paper and into the shadow on the egg. Along the terminator, sometimes you will see a core shadow. It's a darker plane that defines the edge of the shadow. The thickness and softness of the core shadow can vary quite a bit. It depends on the thickness of the form, how sharp the edge is between the planes of light and dark, or the angle and position of the reflecting light source. Sometimes you won't see the core shadow at all, only if there is something on the shadow side to reflect back enough light to create a visible difference in value. This dark piece of paper reflects less light than the white paper. You can see a drastic difference in the value of the reflected light. Also, regarding the visibility of a core shadow, the reflection has to come from the right angle. If it's directly behind the shadow side, it will create a nice core shadow. If we move the reflection source closer to the angle of the main light source, it will illuminate the area where the core shadow would have been. If you don't see a distinct core shadow, many artists choose to cheat one in. So that's an important, what he just said is an important thing. He said that, and he said something that's very true. If you don't see a core shadow or when, when a core shadow is invisible, many artists will cheat one in is his phrase. And the reason artists do that is if you don't see a core shadow, like if we go back to this part, the, the set, you, do, you actually do see a slight core shadow here, but it's harder to create a, an illusion of roundness if you don't have a core shadow and reflected light. Because in effect, the reflected light tells us that the form is not just a flat shape here, but it's a shape that's turning around so that it's facing surfaces that are reflecting light. So the reason it's important that he's pointed out that if artists don't see a reflected light, they'll sometimes cheat one in, is it's important to emphasize that making a convincing illusion of three-dimensional form on a flat surface is not about simply copying what you're looking at. It's about looking at an object and then interpreting it, interpreting the information and deciding what information you're seeing is most important in creating that illusion of three-dimensional volume. It's a very important aspect of the careful looking we're gonna be doing in this class. So artists will often cheat in a reflected light uh, and they may cheat in other things to enhance, um, and make as strong as possible the illusion of three-dimensional volume. Many artists choose to cheat one in because it can add to the three-dimensionality of the form. Reflected light doesn't just affect form shadows. It also affects cast shadows. Less light can bounce into this deep crevice where the egg and table meet, and so that area gets darker as it goes deeper. This is called an occlusion shadow. Moving on to the light zone. Immediately after the terminator is the halftone. These are planes of the form that are partially hit by the direct light. As the planes get closer and closer to facing the light, they will get lighter. And the point where the form points directly at the light is called the center light. Don't confuse the center light with the highlight. The difference between the two is that the center light is the plane facing the light source whereas the highlight is a reflection of the light source. A reflection will move depending on where the viewer is. So let's say this is the egg. The viewer or the camera is down here and the light source is over here. The center light will be here facing the light source. The highlight, however, will need to be at the point where the light can bounce off the surface of the egg and reach the viewer's eyes. These two angles need to be equal. If you've played billiards, this is very similar. To test this concept, let's mark the point of the highlight. And mark another point for the center light. 
Now let's move the camera and see what happens. Okay, you can see here that the highlight moved to a different spot following the camera. The center of light hasn't changed. It's still pointing directly at the light source. Don't let the math of all this confuse you. Highlights and cast shadows that we discussed earlier can be changed and they'll still look believable. Nobody's gonna call you on a highlight being in the wrong spot. I can take the highlight on this egg, move it to a different spot and change the shape. And it still looks believable. I will often change the shape of a cast shadow to better describe the form it's being cast onto. For example, if I have an object that casts a shadow appearing to go against the form. The form of this paper towel roll is a cylinder. And to show that, I would change the cast shadow from the egg to wrap around the cylinder. I usually try to describe the form that the shadow is casting onto rather than the form casting the shadow. So give yourself artistic license. Learn the rules and then learn how you can break the rules to improve your drawing. I just want to let you guys know I'll be releasing a DVD very soon. So keep your eyes out. It's going to have all the video tutorials I've done so far, plus a few extras that will be available only on the DVD. I'm hoping to have it available in the next few weeks. And as always, if you like this video, share with your friends. They might like it too. And don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter on Proco.com to get the latest and greatest video tutorials. See ya. Um, so I think that he does a good job um, clearly explaining um, light and shadow. And I think that it's helpful to go over that again. Again, you know, he's he, he has some useful information. And for anyone who's interested in going deeper into um, some of these technical um, skills we study. There are actually a lot of, um, you know, more and more there are good um, free tutorials online, some better than others. Um, but often you can find some good um, descriptions and he's pretty good. Um, you know, he's, he illustrates clearly he has, um, you know, good animation um, to explain some of these concepts. I, I certainly do not necessarily suggest that, they're, that they're, their art or the art that they like is something that I am um, advocating for. I think it, simply the information they are providing for you. So I'm not advocating for it one way or the other. I'm gonna say, stay completely neutral um, on their, on either the artist's own art or some of the art they show. Um, but the instruction and the information they give is often very good. So I will post this video on Blackboard. I'll provide a link to it on Blackboard. Um, if anybody needs to go back and look at that. Okay, so before we do, um, before we do our demonstration, I want to show people how we are going, how you should set up the situations you paint from, okay? Um, so that you know what to do. When you're setting up at home. So you can see here a corner of my studio and so what what I have here that by the way if anyone's wondering why I have a little mannequin it's because when I paint clothing I often set it up on that mannequin um, just to, sh to show you guys a, f a few things here um, so my studio um, is I, I mentioned that I have north facing windows. So the light in my studio, I, I like to whenever possible use window light because I, I like the quality of window light. Um, so I have north facing windows. So I, I always have the light coming from the left when I'm working. Uh, you know, I do work at night. So at night I turn on these lights here, which are, um, they approximate the same color and direction of the window light. Um, but so again, just to emphasize, 
always thinking about light that you're working from. Um, so I'm gonna say this um, sort of, I, I, I hesitate to say this because, um, well, if anybody in the class has a, has a room that you can work in that has north facing windows only, there's no, there's no, um, there are no other windows in the room other than north facing windows, and you always can work during the day, then you can probably avoid doing this, getting a box, um, and just use the window light for your objects that you paint. But if you do that, you have to be 100% certain that you have north light windows and you're always going to be able to use them. If you don't, then, then you absolutely need to do what I'm about to show you, okay? Um, okay, so let's just look for one second at this kind of random collection of junk. Um, again, I have, just so that we're thinking about light, I have north light um, windows, right, coming from a single direction. So notice the um, notice the the mannequin I pointed out a minute ago. Notice how its head is illuminated in that same kind of breakdown of light and shadow that we've been talking about. Right, so light coming from the left, the right side of the form as it turns away from the light source goes into shadow. Um, you'll notice in the box as it's positioned right now, there's the part of the box that the interior of the box that is not illuminated. We can clearly see this cast shadow that's being created by the light streaming in from the left. Um, so again, just start noticing what happens with a light and shadow situation. Okay, so for the most part, everyone's going to need to get a box like this. Okay. So I'm gonna do something now. So I have, I have my, again, I'm working in a, a North Light studio, so I have light coming from one direction, but these studios are equipped with overhead fluorescence. So let me turn those on for a second. So when I turn on those overhead fluorescents, um, you can see the way light, the light changes um, in, in, in some areas. So the, the window light is dominating, but some of these shadows get filled in and so on. So now I have light coming from every direction. So it's, it would be very difficult to set up a controlled lighting situation in this room right now. So that's why we need the box. That's why I've asked people to get a box. So, uh, you want to take your box and create a situation where you are minimizing as much as possible the light that is hitting your object. Okay, so we're in effect creating a kind of shadow box. So now we want to, now we want to um, create a situation where um, we, we are able to control the light on an object we're setting up. So I'm gonna position this box so that most light is being blocked. Right? And then I'm going to set up object in that box and illuminate it in a way that's useful for what we're doing today. So let's just, by way of explanation, at first we'll take a comb and an apple. We're not going to be doing anything like this. 
We have a cone and an apple. And right now we don't have a very useful lighting, uh, lighting situation. You certainly could paint it, but it's more difficult to identify the light. So I'm going to take a light that's something like what I asked you to buy or, or asked you to get in one way or another. This is a very good option, something like this that you can buy inexpensively at a hardware store. And I am going to use this to illuminate the objects I'm looking at. So I'm going to position it so that I have a situation where there's a clarity of light and shadow on the object I'm painting. So I'm gonna take my light stand here, I have a light stand, and I'm going to clip my light onto the light stand. Like that. And I'm, I'm positioning the light from the left so that I can see on the objects now a clear light mass, a shadow mass, a light mass, a shadow mass. I can clearly see cast shadows. I can identify on the objects those elements of light and shadow we were talking about today. Um, this camera tends to blow out this kind of intense lighting. So we don't see a lot in the light, but we can see core of the shadow, reflected light, core of the shadow, reflected light. So this is the kind of setup I want you to use in our class. You're going to need to get a box so that you're controlling the light. In other words, this box is preventing light from coming in this way, from above, behind, and so on. I have my light position, so it's illuminating those objects in a very deliberate and clear way. So we are really understanding how light works as it falls on forms. Um, I feel like I was gonna say something else about that. Any questions about this? It's oh, pretty clear, thanks. When we're painting, we have to include what we see in the background as far as the detail of the box. I'm sorry. I. I have to keep my windows open because I don't have air conditioning and there was just a very loud backfire. So can you ask that again? So I was saying when we're painting, do I, do we have to paint the detail of the box in the background? No, no, you do not. And um, you can also, if, if you, I mean, that's kind of depressing looking, right? So if you want to put like a piece of paper back there, don't put white paper though, because white paper is going to bounce too much light around. But if you want to get some construction paper and cover that up, that's fine. No, you do not have to paint the details. In fact, do not paint the details. That's, that's just going to distract us from what we really want to do. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Um, I do feel like I was going to say something. Anyway. Um, oh, okay. So let me be, I want to be clear about something because I often run into this problem. Um, or students in the class always run into this problem. Remember, we're, again, we're trying to study light and shadow. So we, we want to be able to use a form shadow and a cast shadow. So you have to be sure that you're setting up your light um, far back enough so that you can see a clear form shadow always. Okay, so the light has to be coming the light can't be too much in front of the object. So if, if the light's coming from too much in front of the object, then we start not being able to see enough of a course, enough of a form shadow. We, we see a little sliver of a form shadow, but you want, we see a cast shadow, but not enough of a form shadow. So you want to make sure that you're always setting up your light. So it's further, further, so it's, it's back in space enough so that you're always getting a large enough form shadow to really be able to study the elements of light and shadow. So you always want the form shadow for, uh, for our purposes, you always want the form shadow to be at least one quarter to one third of the object. 
Um, is that clear to everybody? Can I, I wanna, that's a really important element of setting up your objects. Um, can I explain that further? What about no, the um, okay. of the light? Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alexis. Um, what about the height of the light? Does it matter if it's higher or or well, lower than? I mean, ideally, you would want it to be. Um, not want it to be too low. It can be lower than I have it. You know, that's fine. Um, you don't want it to be. I mean, that would work, but it's getting. You know, that's getting to be a little bit of a, I mean, I don't know, you could do this, but we usually don't see things illuminated that way. You know, it gives a little bit of that horror movie look. Um, yeah. If you want to do that, I would recommend doing it from above or level with the objects. Um, are there any other questions about this? No, thanks. Sorry, I'm talking over people. I apologize. No, it's okay. Um, okay, I, I want to show, so I'm at, but we're not painting cones and apples today. We're, we're painting an egg. So let me show you something about painting an egg. One of, some, you know, one of the difficulties of painting an egg may be that your egg rolls around. So what do I mean by that? So if you put an egg down, oh, that happens to stay put. But it may roll around like that, right? And sometimes that happens more, um, more than others. I guess because this is cardboard um, and has those little ridges that's holding it in place. Let me try something. That no longer has bridges. No, that's staying in place. Okay, but if if your egg rolls, let's say you have a surface that's not quite. Um, so you have a surface that's not quite um, level. So your egg rolls. Here's something you can do. A little trick. You could, of course, um, you know, fold a piece of tape and put it on the egg that might work. But you can also take salt, just pour a little bit of salt on the surface, and then place the egg on the salt. And those little um, crystals hold the egg in place. So if you have trouble with the egg rolling, just sprinkle a little salt underneath it, and then um, that'll hold the egg in place. Okay, so I am, um, I am right now going to pause, unless there are any questions, I'm gonna pause the video um, or pause the recording, um, turn off the camera and just very quickly set up my situation that I can create a demo. So before I do that, are there any questions? I'll, I'll be back on in about two minutes. So I, don't, don't go away. Um, any questions about anything? Thank you, no, I'm good. Okay, um, so we're back. Can everyone can hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, that's my setup that I'm gonna be doing the demo from. But just before um, we get onto the demo, I just wanna show you a few things. Um, so I have my window light. I'm enhancing the window light today for the demo with this light here. Um, which is a kind of photo light. It works, it works nicely. Um, okay, so let me just show you my table and my setup. So this is my painting table. And um, just to show you um, some of the things I asked everyone to buy or to get. So I have my, um, 
this is my palette, my, what I usually use. Um, I use a, a piece of quarter inch glass that has a, a middle gray piece of cardboard taped to the back of it. Um, I will not be using that for the demo today because it would be too difficult to show you what I'm mixing. I have a different setup for the demo. Um, I have the brushes I'm gonna be using today. I have my cloth rags, um, pretty well used at this point. I have my paper towels. Those are pieces that have come off. I like these shop towels, these blue paper towels that you can get in hardware stores, but um, regular paper towels will work too. Um, so I have my palette knife. We're going to be using these two colors today. So we're gonna be using um, titanium white and Payne's gray. And um, you're going, you know, I asked you to purchase or, or to have jars. So you're gonna need a container for your mineral spirits. So this is mine. I just have one of these um, containers with this clasped lid and used a lot. And I'm gonna show you something about using mineral spirits. So that's my container of mineral spirits. And I do this because I've spilled it enough times, knocked it on the floor and made a mess. So I put it in that, which is screwed to my table. Okay, so I asked you to get um, at least three jars, a container for your mineral spirits, and then two other containers. So I have a bunch of other containers here. Let's make it simple. So I asked you to get two other containers. So why? I'm gonna show you. So um, mineral spirits can be used over and over again. So after you've painted, after you've done one painting and you've put away your painting materials, you don't need to throw away your mineral spirits, even though they're going to look muddy and dirty. So I used these mineral spirits two days ago, the last time I painted here. Um, and at the end of the day, the mineral spirits had that muddy, dirty look that um, water or mineral spirits has after you've been painting with it all day. But you, you don't wanna just throw this away because mineral spirits are expensive. So after I stopped painting and the mineral spirits sat undisturbed for several hours, what happens is all of that crud that you've cleaned off your brushes settles to the bottom. And on top of this is clean mineral spirits. So when I start painting every day, I take an empty jar and I pour off, I pour off the clean mineral spirits. So those mineral spirits used to be muddy and dirty at the end of the day, the last time I painted, but now all that crud has settled to the bottom. So I'm, I'm pouring off the clean mineral spirits and leaving just a little bit of mineral spirits at the bottom of the jar. And then I'm gonna swirl around all that cruddy stuff. And if it's necessary, you can take a brush and mix that with a little bit of mineral spirits that's left. And then I'm gonna dump that dirty mineral spirits into this jar, I call it a crud jar. So now I have my clean mineral spirits jar and I have my clean mineral spirits and I'm gonna put the clean stuff back into my jar. And now that's 100% usable still. So I, I haven't had to throw away my mineral spirits except for the very tiny bit that was at the very bottom of the lid. So this, um, that crud jar, I cover it and I just keep, keep filling it up every day. Um, and then when that jar is full of that sludgy, muddy crud, um, I just throw it away. Um, you are allowed to do that in New York City. Um, like if you call um, the Department of Sanitation and ask what to do with this jar, they tell you just throw it away in the trash. Um, in some cities, you have to take it to hazardous materials um, waste, but not in New York, at least the last time I checked. So um, can I answer any questions about that? 
I, I want to highly advise people to have some system to do that. Because one, if you throw away your mineral spirits every day, you're gonna be wasting a lot of money. You don't need to do that. Um, and two, it's not good to be, you can't, one, you can't dump mineral spirits down, um, down the sink. That you can't do, both environmentally, but also legally, you can't do that. Um, so it's environmentally better to, to reuse your mineral spirits. Is it the same uh, rules for terpenoid? Yes, mineral spirits, terpenoid, gamsol, they're all the same. Yeah. Should you keep them separate? Can you mix those? Terpenoid, gamsol, and mineral spirits? Yes. Yeah, they can all be mixed. They're all pet petroleum distillate, yep. Okay. Um, I, have I have all of them. I got the mineral spirits, the gamsol, and then I have terpenoid from my other, my. Um, QCC days with painting. Yeah, they can all be mixed. Um, I have a, a paper bag here that I, that I pin to the side of my table. That's where I throw my trash. Um, one, you know, something people can do with their paint stained paper towels and rags. You know, you, you keep some kind of trash container that you throw it in. And then if you're worried about its flammability, can do one of two things. You can either throw it away in the outside trash every day, or if, or you can, um, before throwing this away in your trash inside the house, you can saturate it with water and then throw it away. And that's perfectly safe, okay? So I always um, say this to people, I apologize for the fisheye, the kind of warped, um, the warping of the um, lens. That's just the technology I have. I, you know, I didn't invest in a higher tech setup. Um, so I apologize for that. Okay, so let's get started. So um, we are going to be making a painting of our egg. And the objective of the painting today will be to observe value rela accurate value relationships. So relationships of light and dark and to try as much as we can to create a convincing illusion of the roundness of the volume of this egg. I have a question. Go ahead. Are we, are we doing this together or are we just watching you and then doing it well, later? You're gonna, watch, you're gonna watch the demonstration and then tomorrow, um, tomorrow's class session will be reserved for independent work on your own painting of an egg. Okay. Okay. I, also, I also have one question, another question. Um, so you, you know how your light is coming from the left? Right. Is it okay to have it coming from the right? It's fine. Like yep, right, the right is fine. Okay, okay, that's it, thank you. So I'm oh. my white Are we not logging on tomorrow? No, we are not logging on um, synchronously. So you're going to be working independently on your work. And if you, if you want feedback from me, um, text me and I can um, send you a link. Okay. okay, thank you. So tomorrow is will not be a synchronous class session. 
So I put down my white and my Payne's gray. And so as you can see, Payne's gray is a kind of black. It's actually a blue black. So it's black mixed with a little blue and it's gonna allow us to use black, you know, not so much in this painting or the next one, but in, in future paintings, we're gonna be able to use black as a kind of blue. So I like to start by using Payne's gray. Um, and by the way, I don't normally paint with my palette parallel um, to the, the painting. Some artists actually do do that. Um, I just do it here because it makes it um, e much easier to show you what I'm trying to do. Um, and I also, by the, and, and people ask me this, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't normally have my painting right next to the object. Um, this is just, this particular setup here is simply in order to be able to do a demonstration that's as, uh, as clear as possible. Because I like you to be able to see what I'm looking at that I'm painting. Okay. So, okay, so I, I'm going to start with just a very simple drawing issue. So, um, we're going to be drawing our object. So I'm, I'm thinning my paint a little bit. Um, I'm actually thinning my paint with oil painting medium. Um, and, and if anyone is interested in learning how to use medium, I, I included those elements of medium on the materials list, but you don't have to buy them. So I, I talked about them yesterday. Um, you can also, I'm going to be thinning with, mineral, with medium. You can also just thin your paint a little bit with mineral spirits. So I'm going to just thin the paint a bit so I can draw. And I'm going to um, start by blocking, this is called blocking in. I'm just going to block in the very rough shape of the egg. And so um, why so you're probably asking me why am I blocking in this form with a series of straight lines. So this is an approach to drawing that I think is very useful when you're first learning how to draw. It's to simplify complicated organic forms into a simplified series of straight lines. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the way that curve is really made up, we could understand it as made up of a series of straight angles that slowly merge into one another. And I think you'll see when we um, start using somewhat more complicated forms like um, you know, pieces of fruit and so on, it helps, it actually helps you get an accurate representation of what you're looking at. So I've just blocked in the rough shape of that egg using straight lines. And, uh, you know, we, like we can think of this um, kind of straight line simplification as, <laughs> kind of um, scaffolding around the contour. It's kind of the structural scaffolding around the contour. So I'm obviously making my egg larger than the egg I'm looking at. And um, I I'd like you to you make your, do, a, do your drawing of the egg larger than the egg so that you're using so that you're filling the canvas in a, in a, a way that, that makes some sense, okay? Or in a way that, you know, you don't, want, you don't want to have a tiny form in the middle of this big empty field, okay? So, um, so I have my block in. So a, a reason, and I'll get into this in more depth with other objects, a reason I start with, or I'm gonna suggest to start with, uh, a, a simplification like this is one of the most important things about making a convincing contour is seeing the relation, seeing an accurate relationship 
to certain points on the contour and their relationship to each other, like certain high points on the contour. So I, I don't want to just randomly draw that contour without really looking at where certain key points on the contour. So the high points, the points furthest out from each other, how, what their angle relationship is to one another. So what's the angle relationship between furthest point out here on the lower left, up lower left to the upper right point. And that's maybe not quite so clear when we're drawing something like an egg, but it will become more and more clear as we draw more complex, um, less obviously round forms. So we start with something like this and then we'll slowly um, refine it until we have um, a shape that looks like what we're looking at. The other advantage to using to thinking in, in these kind of straight line terms is that there's a slight, and you don't see it so much because of the direction of, because of how the camera's looking, but there's a slight angle to this egg. There's a slight downward axis. It's, it's moving down to the left. And drawing this object, with a series of straight lines helps me get that axis. It helps me see that axis a little bit better. So um, I, I'm going to, um, if we were in the studio, I would insist people start it this way. I, I obviously can't exactly insist when you're working at home, but I'm, I'm going to strongly recommend that you try this approach. I have a are you what what are you using to give it that um water like um like what to, to wipe out the paint not necessarily to wipe out the paint but because sometimes i'm seeing you touching the the gray paint or the or the the i forgot the name that you said it is right. and then um and then i'm seeing it have like this um what like it's becoming lighter like are you using the gamsol are you are you using like the the oil. Well, I'm using this medium. Right, the medium, yes. And, but you can also use the Gamsol to do that. Okay, okay. And again, if anyone wants to learn how to use medium, um, you know, you, you do need to purchase those things. Um, but we can talk about that, about how to make that. There are, there are mediums that you can buy already made. So if anyone wants to look into that, that's fine too. Or if anyone's interested, if you want me to give you some links, just let me know. Okay. So uh, are you using, I'm sorry, are you using the Gamsol to wipe out the paint yes. since you break, brought that up? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm, okay. Gamsol is, that's what I'm using to, to erase things. Yeah, I don't use the medium to do that. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so I have the shape of the object. So now as part of the drawing, so I'm setting up. So I'm looking at, um, now I'm going to draw the, the space that the object is sitting in. And I'm going to draw the shadows before I actually block them in. So, okay, now I have to ask myself, how am I gonna set up the space I'm looking at? So first of all, I want to draw the division between the tabletop and the wall. And before I draw that, I'm gonna ask myself how the line that divides table from wall intersects the egg. So where does that line cut through the egg? That line cuts through the egg higher than halfway, right? This would be about, this would be about the halfway point in the egg. The line, the line intersects the egg higher than halfway. So I'm seeing that the line intersect the egg about here and then slightly higher because I'm not looking straight at that division between the wall and the table. So it's at a, a slight angle and an angle rising to the left. So I'm looking at that very carefully. And I'm, draw, I'm gonna draw that in. So that's where the egg is positioned in relationship to the back wall. I like that. Okay, 
Okay, now I want to, before I start painting, just, I mean, you know, artists don't always do this, but just so we're really clear about what we're looking for. So I have my shape, I have the rough, um, the rough space that I'm drawing. Now I'm going to draw the shapes of the shadows. So I'm gonna look on my egg, which is illuminated from the left, right? the light's coming from up there. It's hitting my egg. I'm going to identify the terminator. So where does the light end and the shadow start? Right there. Right along that line. That's the terminator. So I'm going to very carefully observe that line and draw it on my egg. So the lot, the, the terminator comes in something like this. Sound like that. And I, I'm again using the straight line approach. Then it shifts forward a little bit and then sort of scoops underneath the head like this. So does everybody see that? Can I, does anybody see something different or want to ask me any questions about what I'm looking at there? Okay. So now I'm going to ask myself where, how, what is the cast shadow doing? So the light is coming again from the left. So it's passing by the form. Um, and then at the point where the shadow starts on the object, so in other words, the point on the contour where the terminator is, light is being blocked from hitting anything from this point under. Right? So there's a cast shadow that creates a kind of shape like that. And then it's and then that cast shadow is moving backwards to the uh, slightly up and to the and to the right. So it's a foreshortened shape of the egg. It's doing something like that. So uh, if I were going to draw this table edge, that would be in there. So I'm seeing the table edge right around here. But I, I just to keep things simple today, I'm not good at going to include that as part of the painting. Um, I'm going to this is a way to check an angle. So I'm gonna hold my brush up to the angle of the table, and then I'm gonna move it over here to see if I've gotten the angle right, and I have not. Um, although your, the way you see it in the camera is a little bit different from the way I see it in my eyes. So let me do it, let me check something. Can you demonstrate that one more time? Oh yeah. Sure. So I would be a little bit off. Yes, I will demonstrate that one more time. So the angle should be something like this. Um, so yes, so what you do, the, the technique is you want to hold, you want to um, hold your brush out at arm's length with your elbow locked. Okay, that's part of the technique. You don't want to be doing, you don't want to be moving your arm back and forth. So you want your elbow locked. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to turn um, your, any straight, any straight object. So your brush or you, some people use a, a knitting needle. Some people use a ruler. You turn it until you're holding your brush up against the angle of the thing you're looking at. Do you see that? And then you just rotate your body around until you've lined up your brush with the angle you have made in your drawing. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you so much. Sure. So again, my point of view is slightly different from the cameras. So they're not exactly the same, but when I check again, my point of view, so you're not gonna see this exactly like I'm seeing the 
camera and then I rotate that around and I have, a, and I have, uh, now my angle is accurate. Okay. So that's just a, a way of checking. I'm just, again, because I don't want to, I, I want to concentrate on the form of the egg and the light and shadow. I'm actually not going to paint all that stuff in there. I'm going to pretend that that edge is not there, but just so people weren't confused. Okay, so now we have the main elements that we're going to be looking at. And I can, Um, so um, I can now start just adjusting my straight line block in so that I'm, I'm pulling, I'm merging those straight lines and pulling. Pulling out the sort of curves on the egg. I'm also going to um, I'm going to check the proportion of my drawing, so the width to the height. I want that to be accurate. So what I'm going to do is again holding my brush, holding my arm um, with my elbow locked. I'm going to measure the height of the object as I see it. And then ask myself how many times that height fits into the width. So it's, it's shorter than the width. So I'm going to check height. And then keeping my hand the same distance from my eyes as it was when I made this measurement, I'm going to compare that measurement to the width. And I'm going to see if that's accurate. So my height needs to be less than the width. And it's approximately that proportional relationship. So I have that about accurate. So that's a, a way of checking your measurement. So now we want to start massing in or blocking in our painting. So what we're going to be trying to do, in addition to trying to find uh, convincing, um, a convincing depiction of lights, I, I, I'm sorry. In addition to trying to find a convincing representation of three-dimensional volume, we're going to be um, attempting to um, accurately depict the values of the setup as we observe it. So what do I mean? When I say value in this context, so V-A-L-U-E, what do I mean by that? Like if we're talking about the values in a drawing or a painting, what, does, what do we mean by that? different um, shades of gray or whatever color you're using. That's right. Different shades of gray um, between white and black. Like that's what that's what value is. The lightness or darkness of something. And we think about those as a, a gradation from, from white to black. Right? So we're going to be trying to you can see that enough, right? We're going to be trying to determine what the value relationships are um, in the object we're looking at. So you don't have to have one of these. I mean, obviously, I mean, you, you can, you can buy those. I made that one, but you can also buy them. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do and always um, always do this. So again, this is something I insist students do when we're working in the studio. I highly recommend you do this. Is I'm going to, before I get into the form itself, I'm going to block in the background and the surface of the table. And I'm going to do that because I want to be very 
careful and very discerning about what the value relationships are that I'm observing in the object itself. And it's gonna be much, much easier for me to determine what the value relationships are here in the object when I have these big values set up around it, if that makes sense. So I am trying, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to ask myself, what's the value of that? What's the degree of lightness of darkness? It's not black, it's not white, it's somewhere in between, right? So what is the degree of lightness of darkness? So just observationally, I see it as something like around that. That's my, that's my first take on that. So I've just mixed up a little bit of my paint. And I'm going to start this by just blocking in very, very broadly. So I, 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 I'm gonna want this to be a very carefully rendered painting. But I don't need to be careful at this point. I just need to get in. I just need to mass in big areas of color or in the case of what we're doing today, value. So I'm using my biggest brush. And I always recommend don't, don't paint, don't make a painting as if you're painting a house. You know, don't like do this. You know, don't do that, like especially in in the service of neatness, if that's the kind of painting you want to be. You want to build up to a, um, you want to build up to a kind of carefully made surface. Again, if that's what you want to do. You want to start in an active way. And the reason for that is um, you want to have, even when you have a sense of even, even if you are making a painting where you're creating a sense of, um, even if you're trying to make a very carefully um, rendered painting, you want to have a certain kind of life and energy to the marks, even if eventually um, you uh, sort of knit all those marks together. So put the paint down in an active way. You also want to start developing um, a sense of putting the paint down in a way that in one way or another reflects the surface that you're painting. So I have a, a broad, roughly blocked in um, background. And I, you know, I think that that's a reasonable approximation of the value I'm looking at, the degree of lightness or darkness, right? Um, Let's, let's, let, let's um, take a little detour for one minute. I think there's something worth pointing out here, uh, something that we'll be thinking about more later in the semester. Let's look at our situation here. We have three grays, one gray, another gray, and another gray. But look at the color differences in those grays. Which of these grays is the coolest? What would you say is the coolest gray? The wall. This wall? Five. I'm sorry? Five. Is that the five or you talking about the slither across? No, if we look, no, I'm not talking about the strip. If we, if we look at this gray, this gray, and this gray, which one is coolest? The background the one the painting. Gray. The background yeah. gray, like that has a kind of bluish cast to it. Right. This is warmer, right? It's open. We might call this a redder or maybe a browner gray. And then that's really kind of a middle gray. It's sort of an absolutely, this is a pretty close to an absolutely neutral gray, right in the middle of color and right in the middle of value. Okay, so I have my background blocked in. So that's gonna help me, that big value now is gonna help me see the values in here. So now I'm going to block in the big, um, area of the surface of the table. Okay, so easy question. What's darker, this or this? What's a darker value? The back wall or the, the surface of the table? The surface of the table. The surface of the table is darker. So in making a decision of what value I need for that, I know I need a darker value. And since the value of my 
back wall, I think was pretty good. I need to make the value for the table in my painting about the same degree of darkness. So if this is about a middle gray, so middle gray number five right there, I probably need to make a darkness something like um, gray number three here or gray number four here, something in that range. So let's see what, let's see. So I'm making that mixture. And then I'm going to block that in. I'm going to bring that right up to the gray I've already put down. And to me, that looks about like that value distinction. Right, so I'm always looking, I'm blocking in looking at relationships. Does the relationship, do the relationships between the values in my painting work or approximate the value, the relationships and the values I'm looking at? So I think, and you know, all of this may change. We, we you know, rarely am I or anybody else exactly right the first time, although there are. I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of perfect pitch in music. Those people who can always tell the exact pitch of a sound they hear. Uh, there are some artists I've noticed who have a kind of perfect pitch when it comes to observing value and color. Uh, I've never... Professor. Yes. Um, when we're using that light box setup, we're not going to have a differentiation between table and wall. So we're well, imagining it. No, no, you want to look at what the situation is in your particular setup. This is just the situation in my setup. Okay. So you look at the specifics of your setup. But if you want to create a situation where there's a clear difference, you could put a piece of construction paper down on the surface of the table. Um, you could alter the interior of the box if you wanted. Having so create said, like a tabletop in a wall with construction paper. Yeah, you could put construction paper on either the back wall or the surface of the box so that you have a value difference. But bear in mind, just because, just because the, tape, the surface that your object is resting on in your box and the back wall of the box, under, under, if they are both under the same lighting conditions, they may be the same value. But because of the position of your light and the angle of the light, it's very possible that the surface of your of the, the the surface of the box on which your object is resting may be a different value than the back wall because there's more light hitting that surface and less light hitting the back wall. So just because they're the same local value, they may be they may actually. Um, be it, they may actually, in fact, be a different value because of the way the light is hitting it. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks. Okay, so now I'm just going to go with, um, I'm gonna block in the surface of the table very broadly. And so um, you'll, I, I'm not looking at any little nuances or any little variations in the surface of the table. So you'll notice that the table is very slightly lighter here, right there, than it is here. Why? I don't tell me why it's slightly lighter here than here. Because the light is closer in the front. Uh, than the, there's two reasons. The lights, it's, this is closer to the light source. There's another reason there's a slightly lighter very subtle patch right there. Maybe the reflection of the egg. Light is reflecting off the egg. That's right. And uh, you know, certainly, if you know, I, I would eventually put that there. But we're not looking at small differences yet. We're looking at big differences in the blocking. I'm not going to block in those little nuances at this point. I'll start to put some of them in. But you always, always, when making a painting. You want to work from the very large, simplified masses 
down to the smaller ones. You always want to go from big to small. I have a technical question. Uh -huh. um, so when you're getting the paint, is it just like the dry brush on the paint or do you have to like put mineral spirits on it? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fitting the paint with a little bit of mineral spirits. Okay. So now that's a kind of debate among artists. There are some artists who say you should, you should never thin the paint. That you should always put it down without thinning it. So if I do that, uh, this is paint that hasn't been thinned. It's a little harder to move around, uh, although that doesn't look like it's that much harder. If you don't want to thin your paint, you don't have to. You're just going to be working. You just get a different kind of surface, but that's fine. If you don't, if you you can uh, you can either thin it or put it on straight out of the tube. And I, I would recommend people experiment with that. You, but you do get a different kind of surface, depending on which one you choose. Okay, so now I am going to, now I'm gonna block in the big mass of the light and the big mass of the shadow. And I'm going to be extremely simple with this. So I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna, again, I'm, I'm working from big to small. So when I'm starting to block in um, the object itself, I'm going to simplify the lights and the darks into the, the biggest, simplest average of all the values I see. I'm not going to look at all the little nuances. So I'm not going to block in a dark here, then a light here, then slightly darker. I'm not gonna block in a light here, then a dark here, then a light here. I'm gonna just block in very simple average masses of lights and darks. So the first thing I'm gonna block in is the form shadow. So the shadow on the object itself. Now in determining what that value should be, I'm gonna compare the value of the form shadow to the value of the back wall. The value of the form shadow is darker than the back wall. It's actually about the same value as the tabletop. Do you see that? So if you look at the value of the form shadow and the value of the tabletop, they're about the same. So in the first block in, I'm just going to use the very same value because, they, because they're about the same value. Now there are little differences Um, within, within that, because there's variations within the shadow, there are differences, but I'm not going to paint them. I'm just going to block in the simplest. Depiction of the whites and the darks that I can. That's step one. So again, working from large to small, keeping things very, very simple. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is block in the cast shadow. And the cast shadow is clearly darker than the form shadow or the surface of the table. Now that has a, a good amount of value variation within it. But again, at first, I'm just going to look at the big simple average of that. So I think something for the main part of the cast shadow. So I'm looking first at the main part of the cast shadow, not the occlusion shadow. So I'm gonna to try to get that 
the right degree of darkness in relationship to the object itself. And I think it's about something like that. I think that's in the ballpark. Professor, for our home studio setup, what watt of bulb and what type of bulb? Well, any kind of bulb. But, you know, I find that a 60 watt bulb works perfectly fine. 60 watt, 100, that works perfectly fine. So this thing I'm using right now is called a, a mall stick, M-A-H-L. Some artists use this. It's, you can prop it up on your easel. It helps you keep your hand off the painting. Um, mall, it, it's M, again, M-A-H-L. That's a weird word, but it comes from the Dutch word for painter, which is maler, M-A-H-L-E-R. And, um, So that's what these are called. So basically translated, it means painter's stick. You can actually get them in um, art supply stores. And the, what I'm using is just a, a, a dowel from the hardware store. And I put this little rubber stopper on the top. Um, the ones you buy at the hardware store are made of metal and you can take them apart so that they're transportable. They're actually kind of better. Um, but they cost like 25 bucks, where this costs, you know, two or three dollars. Okay, so I think I'm seeing the cash shadow doing something roughly like that. So really at this stage, I'm just blocking in the big simplified shapes, light, shadow, the big surfaces of the table, um, the surface of, the wall and so on. That sound you hear right now is me cleaning my brushes, the mineral spirits. So Professor, the, you're using two different brushes. You're using number four and what? Yeah, I'm using two different brushes. So I blocked in the main background with a number eight. And right now I'm using a number four. So you always clean your brushes in mineral spirits, never water or anything? Well, you can't, you can't, uh, water doesn't clean, doesn't thin oil paint. At the end of the, at the end of the painting day, I thoroughly clean them in mineral spirits. And then I clean them in soap and water. If you use soap and water, it cleans them. Um, that's like an end of the day cleaning to get everything out. And if you do that every day, your brushes stay much, um, they last much longer. So at the end of every day, I definitely recommend cleaning your brushes in soap and water. Okay, so now I'm gonna block in the big light mass. Now, unfortunately, because of the fact that this is not a very advanced camera, you're not seeing um, the, all of the values in here. You are seeing um, the main light the light, main light zone, uh, the half tone, although it's a little bit sharp you know, in the way the camera's picking it up, there is yeah. a slightly discernible highlight right here. So you just have to trust me on that. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna block in the big white mass. And so this is a white egg. So that big white zone, you know, that big white zone is practically pure white, but not quite. So it's, it's slightly darker than pure white. So I'm putting a little bit of, um, putting just a little bit of of the gray in it.
And again, just blocking in the big simplified mass. And I'm blocking that light in right up to the shadow. So it appears at first that I just have two flat shapes. In the light mass and the dark mass. So I can just rub them a little bit together at first. We'll deal with a more thorough transition. It's a very simple, right? Simple light, dark. Okay, so we've started our painting by carefully observing the big masses of value in the background, then the big masses of value that create the large mass of light and the large mass of shadow on the form itself, and the large shape of value that creates the cast shadow. Now to start making this painting a more fully developed painting, a painting where the object starts to develop more and more a clear um, sense of three-dimensional volume, we're going to start, we're, we're not going to just look, kind of arbitrarily look and copy whatever we see. We're going to start looking for those elements of light and shadow we talked about. So the first thing I want to do is I want to soften that terminate. So I want to start indicating the fact that this is a round volume where the dark rolls into the light. So I want to start giving some sense of those specific half tones. So I have my dark, right? this is my shadow mass, and then I have my light mass. I'm going to ask myself, what's the value of that middle tone? You know, it's somewhere between that, the value of that light and the value of that dark. So I'm going to mix up a gray, something like that. And now I'm going to start blocking in that middle tone. Because I want, I want that volume to start rolling from light into shadow. Right? And so I'm, I'm asking myself, is my value the value I want? I would say that it's in the ballpark. Again, I may need to change this eventually a bit, but I think it's, I think it's around what I need. So I'm painting this now wet into wet. And as I, as I apply that, I'm, I'm using, um, certain kind of stroke to start merging those together. So that the half tone gradates into the light. So I've got my half tone started. And now I want to continue to soften this edge. I want to bring in a half tone that's going to start um, continually softening that edge. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with a slightly smaller brush now. And I'm going to st start stitching in, call this stitching in, a half tone that's just going to, to give a slight gradation to that edge. So you don't want to you don't want to put down a dark and a light and then just like madly blend those together. 
you want to be looking at the way the half tone, the specific way the half tone rolls in or rolls up that, that um, shadow into the light. Just using that half tone to start nudging those tones together. Uh, I'm going to, before I go any further, I'm going to clean up this shadow mass a bit. So what, um, so now that we have light, dark, and we're starting, we've started to put in, a, in the half tone, what, what are some of those el other elements of lights and shadows that we want to look for? Anyone remember any of those names? I don't remember the name, but isn't there like reflected light within the shadow? Yeah, so that's the name, reflected light. So let me just clean up this edge a little bit. Whoops. So I haven't forgotten the reflected light. I just want to start cleaning up these edges just a bit, get rid of the drawing marks. Okay, so reflected light. So looking at the egg on the table and looking at the painting, 
how should I make that reflected light? What do people think? Should I darken the core of the shadow and thereby create the reflected light? Or does it look like I should lighten the, the, the shadow mass? What do people think? It feels like um, around where the reflective band would be from the table should be darkened a bit. I agree with you. I think that the way to make, to create a sense of reflected light is to actually darken, I think what you mean is darken that band of the, the core of the shadow. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. Because, and the reason for that, or the reason for that is if I look at the value relationship between the reflected light here and the table behind it, to me that, uh, to me, I don't have any room to make this light. If I start to make this lighter, that's gonna, that relationship's gonna be off. In fact, this needs to get a little bit, that should actually be a little bit darker. Or actually the table back here should be a little bit lighter. Um, so this, I don't think I have room to make that any lighter. I think if I make this lighter, it's going to get too light. So that means then that in order to make the reflected light, I have to, Uh, I have to darken the core of the shadow. I'm just, as before I do that again, just slightly cleaning up the drawing of the egg. So sort of progressively working on that. So getting this contour to read a little bit more convincingly as that round shape of an egg. I feel like, I feel like this line needs to be just a little bit higher. Just a little. Okay, so let's look where, what's happening with that core of the shadow. But just before I do that, I'm going to even out a little bit more the, the main shadow mass here. I want that whole thing to be a little bit more of an even unified value. I'm going to make just a slightly darker value to paint that core of the shadow. So again, the core of the shadow here, that, little, that band of shadow that runs right down here. So following the shape and the direction of that core of the shadow, painting wet into wet. As I'm putting it in, I'm trying to keep the clear division between light and shadow, but also allowing there to be something of a half tone.
and you'll notice that where there's a lot of light bouncing off the surface on, into the, the shadow mass underneath, the shadow mass becomes a little bit lighter and less obvious. It's still there, but it just has a kind of softness to it. I'll try to indicate. So now, so we made the reflected light by, by making the core of the shadow darker. We did not need to lighten that value we had for the shadow mass at all. I'm gonna do a couple of things. Um, I'm going to now put in the occlusion shadow. So the really very darkest part of the shadow area. And this is almost a pure black. So that very dark in there. And that's going to, um, you'll see that will help make this, that putting in the occlusion shadow will help make this read as bright as it does and what we're looking at. Um, another thing I'm going to do is <laughs> cast shadow also in the half tone, right? So the, the transition from cast shadow to tabletop behind it isn't quite as, as stark as that. It's just a little softness at the edge of that cast shadow. Now, another thing I want to do at this point is I want to notice how the table appears brighter back here. This in reality, this is probably not brighter than that, but it appears to be brighter because it's surrounded by so much dark. So it's very common, it's a common convention to indicate that, sorry. So 
So I'm just lightening the table back here. That's a little bit, no, I guess that's about right. I think that's good. Maybe a little bit light, I don't know. I'll have to step back and look at it. And then as we get closer to the wall, there's the appearance that that gets a little bit darker. Again, uh, there's a highlight right around here. So I'm going to go in with some pure white. Hit that right around there. I think I'm going to look at the shape of that highlight. So it's a little bit thicker as it goes up. And I can soften that highlight into the surrounding area. That's a smaller brush, so that would be a, a, a two or this that is a, we'll be using? A number one. I could use a number two for this. Do I have a number two out? Um, you don't have to, I mean, it's, you don't necessarily have to use these brushes I'm using. Okay. Um, you know, like you could, and some artists do this. Some artists like doing this. Um, oh, let's see. Let me get a brush here I can show you with. You know, some artists find it like they like to you say a brush this size instead of that small one. You can still tap it in there. So again, right. you don't have to use these brushes I'm using. Uh, you know, just experiment. Maybe you'll end up liking using this one. Now we actually have the main elements of light and shadow down that we need. Mm -hmm. Now where we are is just a question of refining. So for me, the transitions here look a little bit choppy and a little bit rough. So I would now go so, and just start refining them. So with the highlighting part, can you use a pull down force or? Can you use a what? To, uh, um, how you say it, uh, pull down just slightly pull curve instead of just tapping it. Can you pull down like that? Yes, with, a, with the brush you're using, can we just pull like a pull swoop? Yeah. To make the highlight? Yeah. Okay. So, so again, we have all of our values down. It, at this point, it's a, an issue of refining. So mm -hmm. I'm going to slowly refine the half tone until it's not quite as choppy as it appears right now. I want a transition that seems to me to more reflect the transition that I see on the egg. I certainly want to keep a clarity of the division between the light and shadow. I want there to be a slight gradation at that edge. Thank you. 
So I asked people to get the Sumi brush, right? That, um, that brush that's, uh, that comes out of the um, Chinese watercolor tradition. So what, what those are useful for are as blending brushes. So we can also use brushes, something like these. These are kind of old, soft, old, soft brushes. And what, and you, you can use that Sumi brush. If you want to start blending these tones, you can take a soft, dry brush, once you have all the values in, and you can use this to blend those tones. Now, there are some um, artists who say you should never blend, that you should just keep um, putting down tones until they knit together. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, you certainly can work that way. And, and it's possible to use a blending brush in a way that you know, everything just turns into like these smears on the surface. But if you really get, if you really put down all of the values you need and you use a blending brush just as a way of a kind of final knitting together of those uh, values, I think it's perfectly acceptable to do this. So I, I certainly do. Now, you don't have to aim to achieve a kind of absolutely um, an absolutely um, clean gradation of tones. Clean is not the right word. I don't want to use the word smooth, but, um, but th this is a kind of style. And I, I just like making my paintings this way. This is a way of doing it. So I'm now, now that I have most of the tones down I need, I'm just blending them. And I will certainly continue to work on this. I'm just seeing, right now seeing where I am. And again, that Sumi brush I asked you to buy is useful for this. That's a, a good option as a brush to use to start doing this kind of And, and if I were to do, if I were just making this painting just for myself um, to do a fully developed painting of an egg, I would do this for sure in at least two layers. So I would do this block in as carefully as possible. And then I would let it dry and I would do another layer. So that um, just as a way of correcting and reinforcing observations, refining um, I, I have no expectation that you all do the two, two legs. There are paintings we're going to work on more than one day, but not this one. Do you wipe the brush off every time you're correcting an area or smoothing out an area? Yeah, I wipe off any excess paint, yes. Okay. Uh, 
Um, this, by the way, these, by the way, you know, depending on how much people want to invest, I don't ask people to buy these, but these are also the kinds of brushes that are good for blending. So this is a watercolor brush here. This is called a wash brush. Um, and, um, you know, it looks a little bit like a makeup brush. Those are good for blending. These are fan brushes. That's what these are made for. Um, so, you know, if, again, if you want to start the process of like knitting, you're knitting this, the strokes together, you can use a fan brush for that. Again, this is the type of thing that some teachers of painting will tell you not to do. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, again, you can overdo it, but um, you know, if, if you're interested in starting to bring, starting to knit these tones together, these are some of the tools that can be used. They're not absolutely necessary, so I don't um, ask people to buy them. But again, for most of what I'm doing here, or really all of the blending I'm doing here, you can use your um, Sumi brush. Okay, so I am going to um, leave the demo here. I'm not going to just continue to force everybody to watch me refine this. Um, we have all of those major elements of light and shadow that we want. Um, and I, I'll continue to work on this a bit before I post it. Um, I guess just again, I'm just starting to knit some of these together. This is not a final pass, I just want to start bringing some of my values together so that I get a, so I can get a better sense of what I'm looking at here. That little bit of light there needs to be adjusted. But um, yeah, so now the process at this, from this point forward is, is primarily one of refining. Again, because we have those major elements of light and shadow that we're looking um, does anybody have any questions about anything of this process? I have a question about um, the chemical that you were using before with the jar. Okay. That you were in and out. Was that the Gamsol? Um, you mean this? That the one that created that muddy texture. It created what texture? It had a muddy texture and you were pouring it in and out of the jars. Oh, that was Gamsol, yeah. Okay, that's Gamsol, yeah. thank that you. That's Gamsol, that, so at the end, the muddiness, like at the end of your painting day, you're gonna find that your jar full of Gamsol is all muddy. So again, you okay. let that settle um, overnight and then you pour out the clean stuff. Um, when you start painting again tomorrow or whenever, or whenever you start painting. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. So I'll show people that again, just so that, again, the process is clear. So that um, blending that I was just doing in part helps me see a little bit more clearly the values I've put down. And now, that, that wasn't like an absolutely finishing thing. I'm now, I would now go back into this, start adjusting and correcting things. Um, so, for example, where there is too much lightness in the background. I, I have a question. Go ahead. When you started drawing the egg, right? Yeah. There's still the lines there. Is I mean, do we color over those lines or we leave those lines there to pull the egg out? Well, as a dimensional. I think eventually you want to strive for making a painting where there are no lines. So okay. 
essentially, I would any any remaining evidence of lines in my painting, uh -huh. I I would eventually get rid of. Okay. Uh, you know, there's there are painters who work with line. You know, that's part of their language. But I think mm -hmm. our purpose is let's learn how to make a painting where we create an illusion just by relationships of values with no line. If later you want to use line in your painting, then obviously you can. Um, does that make sense? Yes. But the purpose is just to make a dimensional, oh. making it a, a dimensional and to separate the wall, the table, and the egg. That's right. Okay. Oh, that's a lot. Okay. All right. This looks like fun. And I'll, I, I will show one last thing. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do, since you asked me about that edge, uh -huh. I'm gonna take a smaller brush. And so you, you, made me, you made me realize, to me this edge looks a little bit papery. In other words, I feel like when we get to that edge, it's like, the, it's like a piece of cut paper. I don't right, know like you could peel it off. So what, what painters will often do, and you'll hear some artists like really emphasize this, is they'll, they'll always strive to create soft edges. So sometimes a painter will go in and like drag paint right on that edge. I'm gonna just do a little, I'm gonna go around that edge, a little bit of my background color. And just, again, I'm gonna use the term, like I'm, I'm doing like little stitches here at the edge. Just to give a little bit of softness to that edge. Because I don't like the paperiness that your question made me notice. I'm sorry. Well, it's okay. Oh, I appreciate it. Just want to address that edge. So there, there are some painters who go far as far as saying that painting is all about the edges. Hmm. Seems a little bit totalizing to me, but so now I feel like I'm starting to get a little bit more of a sense of that edge rolling around in space. I take one of my my um, blending brushes and then just ride along that edge to just soften those. And you start to get a, a softer, slightly softer edge, a sense that it's, so we're, we're, we no longer have quite so much the sense that it's a kind of paper edge. Now we keep working on that. And then actually one other modification I'll make before I let you go, because I think this is important. Um, I'm looking at the relationship of the value between the wall and the shadow on the egg. And in my painting, this value and that value are about the same, but they're not, um, as I'm looking at the setup, warm shadow and in particular the core of the shadow creates a darker value that sets off the value of the wall behind. So I want to make sure I indicate that in my painting. So this value, this, I think I need a little bit more of a carefully observed core of the shadow. The core of the shadow gets thicker near the top. Are we going to be able, are we going to have to put in pictures of our setup? Um, yes, thank you for reminding me. Uh, I will talk about that before we end today.
And then, so um, now that I have all the values down and I can start making comparisons without any of the white of the canvas interfering with the way I'm seeing my painting, I do see that I think I need to make the back wall where it meets the egg. Just I need to lighten this just a little bit. The set off the shadow of the egg. So if you'll notice, we can clearly that the, there's clearly a, a darker value on the form than the value of the back wall. So I want to indicate that. I'm going to just light the back wall. Just a bit where it meets the shadow. Okay. So again, at this point now, it's a question of refining um, because I think we have those major elements of light and shadow that we're looking for. Um, any questions about any of the painting I did or any of the, um, the, the technical details that we talked about today? I don't think we can do that much detail in the first time. Probably not. I mean, I, I have been doing this for many years and I have, um, I can't tell you how many times I've done, done a demonstration of a cone, a sphere, or a, an egg. So um, I, I could practically do this without even looking. Um, so yes, you should not worry if, if you have never painted, you should not worry about <coughs> Not that this is that good, but the, being able to get, you know, being, to, being able to control the information like I can, just because if I can't, then I have no business teaching at this point. But, uh, but you certainly want to try your best, and you want to try to include all those elements that we talked about, all those elements of light and shadow that we talked about today. Any other questions? If we wanted to include um, paper in the cardboard box, do you recommend um, putting black paper? Well, I mean, it's up to you. Black, the black paper will um, help limit reflections. So um, that's fine, black paper or dark, you know, dark paper. I certainly would not put white paper, um, definitely do not put white paper on the surface here because that's going to bounce so much light back up that it's going to be really hard to see um, the values and the shadow mass. But, you know, any other paper, any, any particularly a middle value or a dark paper, I think that's a great idea. Are you asking because you just think the box is ugly? Yeah, I, I think it's ugly. Yeah, it's ugly. I mean, you can also put a piece of, you know, cloth down if you have like an old... Uh, single color cloth, anything. And yes, you can certainly do that. Thank you. Yes, so, okay. So you are going to, oh, actually I have to go over something else I forgot to go over. So you're gonna be taking, you're gonna be doing your paintings. Tomorrow is an independent work day. Um, and then, and obviously we're, these are not due until Monday morning at nine. So you can, do, you can work on it as much as you want between now and next Monday at nine. Um, and you're going to submit an image of your painting to Blackboard. So go to Blackboard, go to assignments. Um, you'll be able to figure out how to submit your image, okay? Now, please everybody um, listen carefully to this because this is important. You have to send me a photograph of your painting and a photograph of your still life setup. So you have to take a photograph of, that shows me your box, your egg, and your light, 
and the light and shadow situation that you were working from. That's a requirement. I don't, ex I, I won't grade your homework. I, I won't grade your work unless I see both a photograph of the work you did and a photograph of your setup. That's a photograph independent of the Blackboard submission. So two photographs of the actual painting. Yes, you submit both photographs on Blackboard. You can, you can submit them both under one assignment. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so let me show you something uh, before we end today and I will post this. You actually can't see the document I just pulled up, can you? No, we just see your okay. painting set up and you. Okay, so now you can see this? Yes. Okay, so um, I, I'll post this on, on Blackboard. So this is just a document I put together on how to photograph a painting um, for online submission. So make sure your work is well lit. So either, this is a good way to do it. Place it on a table right next to a window, as long as there's not direct sunlight streaming in. Or, or you could, this person, put the painting on the floor next to an open door. Um, so so put, make sure it's well lit. Don't take a photograph of your painting while it's in shadow or there's a light behind it. I need to see it clearly. And then make sure that the, the painting is square to the frame of the camera lens on your phone. I'm assuming everyone's going to be using their phone. So notice how this painting is square to the frame of the camera lens. That's step two. Make sure it's well lit and square to the camera lens. Do not send me a photograph that looks like this, where the, where the photograph is, where the painting is not square to the lens of the camera. So square to the lens of the camera and then use your editing tools in all phones have these editing tools. You can all figure them out or use Photoshop if you have Photoshop to crop, um, to crop your painting down to the painting itself. So that when you submit your painting, it's cropped to the painting. So again, don't send me an image of your painting that is at an angle like this. You know, I wanna see it square. I wanna see the whole painting without any distortions. Um, don't send it to me so that it's not well lit, lit. This is poorly lit. So make sure it's well lit like this and make sure you crop out all background. I don't wanna be, I'm looking at your painting. I'm not looking at rose wallpaper or um, you know, your kitchen or whatever else. So everybody, everybody. I'm sorry to interrupt you. sometimes the camera, if it's like parallel to the photograph, creates a weird shadow. You have to kind of lift up your camera a bit. And then the picture or the painting is like, you know, trapezoidy, like it's wider at the top than it is at the bottom. Yeah. So the way to the way to avoid that actually is to have. So what's happening there is the light is too much behind you. Got it. So you want to, I mean, I don't know if people can imagine this because it doesn't show it in this image, but this painting is placed on the floor. So this is the, this is, this is hardwood floor. And then just to the left of the painting here is an open door. Okay. So light is streaming in from the left. And then the person is over the painting taking the photograph. So there's no, so their body or their camera is blocking the light. The same thing would be the case here. I do know what you mean, but you can always, you know, move the painting around and figure out a way to, conf to place the painting in relationship to the light source so that your camera is not casting a shadow on it. But sometimes the, cam the iPhones have that little tilt kind of correct when you edit. You can kind of widen the bottom or the top, that kind of thing. That's fine. If you want to do it that way, I, I don't object to that. Okay. 
but I, I want to be able to see, I, I can't tell, you know, like drawing issues and stuff in a painting like this because there's distortion just in the way the photograph was taken. So I need to see your painting square to the, to the frame, to the camera lens. I mean, and either do that by, by taking the photograph that way, or if you want to use editing tools to adjust that, that's fine. Okay, understood, thank you. Okay. Um, you can, by the way, yeah. Uh, you can ignore this down here. I I'll take this out before I post it, seven and eight. You don't have to worry about naming it. Um, there is a, a download, I think it's a free download called Snapseed. It's definitely available for iPhone and I think it's available for other um, devices that has a lot of editing, photo editing tools. Um, so people may, you know, it has, certainly has an editing tool that you just mentioned, Emilio. So um, if anyone um, wants to experiment with an iPhone editing device, um, that's one I recommend. So any questions about this, about photographing work? No, thank you. Okay, so any questions at all about anything we've covered today? No. Just to